We confuse our feelings for what is true. We confuse information that we like for what is right. Mm -hmm. And that all goes back to where our gut intuitions came come from. They come from the savanna environment, from the tribal savanna environment. That is what they are evolved for, for when we as human beings were hunters and gatherers, were foragers. That's what they are evolved for, for living in small tribes of 15 to maximum 150 people. So kind of small tribes of people who all looked like each other and who thought pretty similarly. So that's kind of one aspect of what's going on with our gut intuitions is tribalism. There are two critical aspects of tribalism. We like people who look like us, who think like us, who feel like us, who have our beliefs, who have everything that seems similar to us. That's one critical aspect of tribalism. The other critical aspect of tribalism, which we saw in the Bernie Ebers and Worldcom and Tycho cases, Enron, is that we will want to climb to the top of the social hierarchy and we don't want to climb down. That's Gleb Tsipersky, up next on the All Things Risk podcast. Welcome and welcome back to the All Things Risk podcast. We're here with episode 126. I'm Ben Catanio, your host. This is my show. If you want to learn how to embrace uncertainty, if you love great conversations, you, my friend, are in the right place. In this episode, we take a close look at some advice, some perceived wisdom that is everywhere. That is going with your gut, making decisions based on what feels right. It's advice that is incredibly popular. It's incredibly common. And it is also incredibly, incredibly wrong. A gut feel is a terrible way to make a decision. To explain is Gleb Tsipersky, who is back with his third appearance on the show. Gleb has authored a new book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. If you haven't listened to our first two episodes or previous two episodes with Gleb Tsipersky, Dr. Gleb Tsipersky. He has an academic background in neuroscience and behavioral economics, is the founder and CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, is the author of several best-selling books, and has appeared on numerous occasions in various media outlets. Today on the show, we tackle the subject of decision-making based on gut feel, why this is bad advice, and what to do instead. And this is a great conversation for anyone who makes decisions, which is, of course, all of us. Not only that, if you are an entrepreneur, a business owner, someone in a leadership position, or simply have a big decision to make in the near future, you will especially want to listen to this entire episode. So let's go. Here is Gleb Tsipersky on why you should never go with your gut. Gleb, welcome back to the All Things Risk podcast. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show. It's wonderful to be back talking about the risks and how to address them then. So you've been on the show a couple of times. But for those of my listeners who have joined All Things Risk since those couple of episodes, it would be great to provide a bit of a quick synopsis of who you are, what you do, your background, all of that good stuff. Sure. Happy to do so. My background is in cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics. So decision making. How do we make decisions? How do we figure out what is true? How do we use that information to make good decisions and how to avoid bad decisions. So that's my background. I look at decisions in all areas, all life areas, especially in business, which we'll talk about today, but also in civic activities and personal life and politics and so on. So a lot of decision making, that's kind of my focus. And I've been became fascinated in this topic actually during the time when I was a kid 
when I was a kid, I saw my parents making some really bad decisions that resulted in a lot of fighting between them. <laughs> and so that was something that even as a kid, I saw that, hey, this is kind of ludicrous. Why are you fighting over these little minor things that really don't matter? And why are you, I mean, uh, I remember this. there was this one really bad fight where my dad, who was a real estate agent, he ended up uh, hiding some money from my mom. I mean, as a real estate agent, he worked in commission, so his money was variable. And he hid some money from my mom and he bought a house for him, uh, bought an apartment for himself elsewhere and uh, you know, kind of rented it out. And in a couple of years, she eventually found out about it. And she was so mad. <laughs> she was really mad. They had this big blowout fight. And then they you know, they separated for a while, actually, as a result of it. I mean, they eventually reconciled. They got back together. But uh, she could never really trust him again <laughs> after mm. that. And uh, so as a kid, even as a kid, I saw people making these really bad decisions. And then that fascinated me. So I decided to study decision making. How do we make decisions? How do we make better decisions? And how do we improve our decision making? I mean, I came of age, actually, in uh, nine, you know, I was born in 81. And I came of age around the dot com boom and bust, you know, 1999, for those people who remember it, party like it's 1999, right? That song, <laughs> you know, for those of us who, you know, that ages me, right? So I was 18 back then. And I remember all these dot coms booming, you know, the web van, pets.com and so on. They had so much money, so much capitalization. And then when I was 21, at the other coming of age, it was 2002. And they were all busting. Mm. <laughs> the web, you know, pets.com and so on. They were all went bust. And it was just very frustrating to see and saddening to see people in, who are supposedly smart people investing billions of dollars into these companies that went bust. And of course, ordinary folks, folks like people who are hearing us right now and myself and others who, I mean, I didn't lose the so much money, but a lot of people lost their life savings, their retirement savings with, with those, with the dot-com boom and bust. And especially bad, especially bad for me was the kind of Enron debacle, the mm -hmm. Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, where business leaders made the, the decisions to hide the losses that they associated with the dot-com bust. They really took uh, those risks to, mm -hmm. to hide those losses. And, you know, it was kind of stupid to really to do that. I mean, we see that right now them spending long time, Bernie Ebers and so on, spending long jail sentences. I mean, they weren't going to get away with it for more than a year or two. It was a terribly bad decision making. And it just came from how they were feeling. I mean, we're driven, what the research on decision making shows, what I learned is that we're driven to decisions by our emotions, by what we feel. About 80 to 90% of our decisions are driven by emotions. And these people were driven by the emotion of not wanting to be perceived as failures, as losers mm -hmm. in the eyes of their fellow business leaders. And these emotions drove them to make terrible decisions. So anyway, so I decided to study this. I did well, coaching, consulting, speaking, and training on this topic for over 20 years. So that's part of my background. And I also went into higher academia, higher education in academia. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist, spent 15 years in academia, seven years as a professor at Ohio State, published a bunch of peer-reviewed papers, and now a book on this topic called Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And so that's my background. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. And there's a lot of really good stuff there. I remember that sort of 1999 to 2002 time. <laughs> Similarly, I was I'm a little bit older than you, but I was graduating at that time. I had studied mm. international relations and political science. And I also came across, I don't know where this, there was a video about the movies that came out in 1999. And they describe all these movies were about the mon the mundane so people working and living in cubicles mm. so the you had the matrix you had fight club and <laughs> those were all about the sort of mundane kind of corporate life and i also remember that time well because when i was trying to figure out what i wanted to do because i was graduating with this degree mm. in international relations and political science and economics and i kept being told that there's a bit of a partially useless degree because the Cold War is over. <laughs> Nobody cares about politics anymore. It's all about business, business, business. And the future is just basically going to be a modified version of the present. 
And then you had, you know, nine eleven and all, mm-hmm. all this other stuff that, and obviously Enron and everything, and how wrong everyone was about what the future was going to look like. Yeah, and we get we get wrong a, a number of things. So it's a yeah, it's it's great to compare the these these contexts and backgrounds. Let's talk a little bit about never go with your gut. Where did this idea to write this book about gut instinct come from? It really came from that background that uh, when I was, um, as I mentioned, when I was a kid and I saw that those instincts, those intuitions for my parents, they weren't making rational decisions. Mm-hmm. They weren't thinking things through. They just felt uh, something and they felt that it was right and they just went ahead and did it. Just like the Bernie Ebers of the world feel something, feel it's right, feel go ahead and do it. Just like Elon Musk feels it's time to tweet something <laughs> and he just goes ahead and does it. Yeah. Or, you know, other... Uh, you or know, smokes marijuana uh, on, a, on a podcast. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and uh, he's not the only one who tweets whenever he feels like he should. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an so. interesting time for all of this because... We we do hear whether it's explicitly or implicitly, you know, go with your gut or mm-hmm. follow your passions or do do this kind of authenticity around what it is you want to do and be. And in some cases, I in some respects, I suppose there's you know there's nothing wrong with that, but it can be very dangerous when taken to the extremes. And I think it's very important to talk about the. The, the dangers of going with your gut. But before we, we get into that, can I just ask mm-hmm. you, what is a gut instinct? What is a gut feel and where does it come from? Sure. A gut feel is just something that you feel intuitively is the right thing. It's very simple. It's very clear. And it's very unfortunate where you talk about authenticity, you talk about all of these ideas. I don't even think it's the problem is not when it's taken to the extreme. The problem is when the concept is perceived to be correct and appropriate because it does things to our mind when we think we should be authentic except, you know, not go to the extreme. That's not the right way to think about it. Authenticity is often, very often, a problem for us, for as human beings, because authentically we belong in the savanna environment, in the <laughs> hunter and forager environment. That's where our authenticity, our gut reactions, our feelings, our instincts, our intuitions, which, you know, they're all the same thing. People, When people say this, be authentic, be primal, I mean, Tony Robbins has his idea, you know, be primal, you know, and so on, or these are all the same things. They, they amount to the same thing. They amount to, if we feel something is right, then it's right. You know, if we feel we love someone, then it's true love. Mm-hmm. If we feel this is the right business decision, then it's the right business decision. If we feel like this is the right uh, person to vote for, then it's the right person to vote for. If we feel that, you know, this is a good business relationship, if we feel that this is a person who would make a good business partner, then this person would make a good business partner. We confuse our feelings for what is true. We confuse information that we like for what is right. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And that all goes back to where our gut intuitions came come from. They come from the savanna environment, from the tribal savanna environment. That is what they are evolved for, for when we as human beings were hunters and gatherers, were foragers. That's what they are evolved for, for living in small tribes of 15 to maximum 150 people. So kind of small tribes of people who all looked like each other and who thought pretty similarly. So that's kind of one aspect of what's going on with our gut intuitions is tribalism. There are two critical aspects of tribalism. We like people who look like us, who think like us, who feel like us, who have our beliefs, who have our, you know, everything that seems similar to us. That's one critical aspect of tribalism. The other critical aspect of tribalism, which we saw in the Bernie Ebers and WorldCom and Tycho cases, Enron, is that we will want to climb to the top of the social hierarchy and we don't want to climb down. And that causes us to feel really bad when we perceive ourselves as going down in the social hierarchy. So that's tribalism. And that explains a lot of what causes us to make very, very, very bad decisions. So that's one aspect of things. Now, the second aspect of things that you need to, that it's very important for us to understand about our feelings is the fight or flight response. Hmm. You might have also heard about it as the saber-toothed tiger response or the lizard brain. 
it's the thing that causes us to overreact greatly to threats, perceived threats. Now, in the Savannah environment, that was really important. That was really good because it was better for us to jump at 100 shadows mm -hmm. than miss one saber-toothed tiger. However, in the current environment, we have many, 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 many less saber-toothed tigers yeah. around us. We're much less likely to die because of saber-toothed tiger, but we greatly overreact to perceived threats around us. And that causes us not only a great deal of stress, but it causes us to make very quick, very poor decisions because they're made very quickly and intuitively. So the tribalism was critical for the survival of our ancestors. We are the descendants of those people who were strongly tribal, who liked others like themselves and who climbed the social hierarchy. We are also the descendants of people who jumped at 100 shadows, so had that strong fight or flight response. So our gut feelings are nothing but those evolutionary impulses. The tribal impulse and the fight or flight impulse. Mm -hmm. And that explains a great deal of what is wrong with our with our societies right now when we have the feeling that something is right and true, which again comes from our savage, natural, primitive background, and we react based on it as though it's the right thing to do, as opposed to doing the civilized thing. Mm -hmm. You know, just like, you know, we can eat with our hands uh, and the, just like follow the natural state, or we can use a fork and knife. We've mm -hmm. learned how to use a fork and knife. Unfortunately, we haven't learned how to not how to avoid going with our gut and being primal. And yes. that's a horrible aspect about our current society and our businesses. It's that type one and type two or system one, system two thinking, isn't it? And we don't always distinguish when we should employ one or we, th we should be thinking more system two uh, than system one. It's a part of that is uh, what's going on there. So uh, mm -hmm. clarifying system one, also called the what I prefer to call the autopilot system, mm -hmm. is our emotions and our intuitions. It's our habits. It's, our, it's mm -hmm. our mental patterns of thought. System two, the what I prefer to call the intentional system, is the more rational, reasonable, reasoning, abstract part of our minds. Now. That doesn't mean we should not use the autopilot system. The autopilot system, system one, is very useful, very important for right. us to use. What the critical things that I'm talking about are, you know, right now, let's, let's go back to the fork and knife example. When you're eating with a fork and knife right now, it's not like you're thinking through every motion, you know, how do I of lift course. the fork? How do I use the yeah, knife? Yeah. But when you were a kid, you had to do that. You had to learn how to use a fork and knife. It's not intuitive. It's not easy. You know, if you look at a baby right now, the baby takes food with its hands and lifts it to its mouth. You know, how much time did it take the baby to learn how to use a fork and knife? A very, very long time. Mm -hmm. Not an intuitive thing at all. But... What happened when that baby learned to use a fork and knife? Right now, all of us very intuitively use a fork and knife to eat things as opposed, you know, we're not going to eat, let's say, you know, baby food. We wouldn't eat baby food, but let's say applesauce, the equivalent. We're, we're going to eat that with a spoon. We're not going to try to eat it with our hands like a baby would. So right now, we've essentially retrained our autopilot system using our intentional system. And right now, we have incorporated the healthy mental habit of eating with a fork and knife and spoon, <laughs> eating with silverware. So the autopilot system, the gut reactions are only a part of the autopilot system. The gut reactions is only a part of what the autopilot mm. system is. We're also, it's also healthy trained mental habits. So we retrain our mental habits using the intentional system to go in the direction of being civilized and actually living effectively in the complex, multipolar, multinational, global environment that we find ourselves in. I mean, it's very untribal here. If we learn, if you look at a contemporary business, it's kind mm -hmm. of the opposite of tribalism, mm -hmm. where you work with very different people who have very different thought patterns. Your business collaborators are going to be very different. Mm -hmm. And you need to, you know, whenever you get a nasty email from someone, you should not respond with a saber-toothed tiger response. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a bad way. It's not a, it's not a life or death situation. So we kind of retrain ourselves in some ways. And unfortunately, in many ways, we don't. And that's the big danger where we don't retrain ourselves and we use the same instincts that we would use for the Savannah environment to make decisions in the contemporary environment. Mm -hmm. Right, right. There's a, there's a lot of good stuff there about system one. And I was just thinking about healthy habit formation. If you 
make mm-hmm. if you use the system system two to create some healthy habits and make those more of your you know your autopilot then then it's then it's useful okay interesting interesting stuff one of the things that came up as i was preparing for this and thinking about this is is there a difference between a gut feeling or a gut instinct and a subconscious thought so something that you've been mulling over in the background and all of a sudden you get like an aha moment an idea a way of solving a problem this type of thing there's not really a difference, and that's very unfortunate for us. Mm. And that is tragic, actually, because what happens is that our gut intuitions, we mistake the healthy mental habits for the with the savage tribal primitive responses. And that's really bad that right. we make those mistakes. You know, right now it feels as intuitive to you to eat with a fork and knife as it would feel, you know, to take that third chocolate chip cookie, right? Mm-hmm. And the chocolate chip cookie, you probably don't want to take the third chocolate chip cookie. You know, the second one is a okay, that's great. But the third one is probably a little bit too much. However, our gut intuitions have evolved from the savannah environment to eat as much sugar as possible. It was really important for us to survive in the savannah that whenever we found a source of sugar, like let's say honey, we would eat as much of it as possible in order to survive. So right now we in, it's still engage in these sorts of similar activities, unfortunately. It's a very strong drive for us. That's why we have the obesity epidemic going on. That's one of the biggest reasons for the obesity epidemic in the modern world. So we mistake we have the same kind of intuition that it's the right thing to eat with a fork and knife and it's the right thing to do to take you know the, the cookie it doesn't feel different to mm. us we can't tell apart our gut reactions the healthy mental habits that we developed from uh, the really problematic tendencies that come from our gut reactions you know let me give you another example let's you've probably uh, if you've worked in the professional world for a while, you've learned how to deal with constructive critical feedback effectively. So right now you're like, okay, somebody's giving me constructive critical mm-hmm. feedback. I should not just yell at them, you know, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. No, I'm right. <laughs> but that's it, it's very intuitive. It feels right to say, no, I'm. What are you saying? Of course I'm right. Of course you're, you know, you're dumb and I'm smart, right? That's the intuitive feeling. You've probably learned that that's not a good way to do. But what you need to do is instead take that constructive critical feedback and use it effectively to improve your performance. Otherwise, you really wouldn't survive very long in the modern yep. corporate environment. It and still stings, so though. You still feel it, and you also know when you're giving feedback, there's a certain way of doing it. And that is you cite the, you know, you cite the evidence, you cite the behaviors. This is what we've observed. This is the, this is, or this is the feedback that I've received from other people. And then you talk about the implications of that feedback, why it needs to change. And then you try to get to a a point where you, you get the person to address the the negative feedback. And Mm -hmm. you know, though, that when you deliver it, that's still going to sting, (laughs) regardless of how long that person has been in a professional environment. And regardless of how Mm -hmm. long you've been in a professional environment, when you hear it first, it does sting. Yes, it does. It does. And so what you're noticing here, the stingness, that's coming from the tribal instinct. Mm. That's coming from because you feel like you're being rejected by someone mm. who's a member of your tribe. And it's very dangerous from the tribal environment. Right, because if you get be kicked rejected. out of the tribe, you 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 die, right? In the old exactly. Savannah world, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. So you are having to deal with a tribal impulse. And you're like, mm. okay, you know, I I'm feeling that tribal impulse, but I have learned over time that the healthy mental habit for me. Healthy mental habit, by, by that I mean something that will adv- advance your goals in the professional world. That the healthy mental habit is not to say you're wrong, no, absolutely, <laughs> I'm not listening to you, blah, 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 <laughs> but to instead incorporate that feedback. In, look at the feedback, evaluate it, incorporate it into your activities, and go forward. So that's kind of where you're seeing yourself, where you're feeling yourself, actually, addressing the autopilot responses and going on to you. Know, actually effectively engage with them. So this is one of the things that you need to learn. And just like you have learned that, it's very important to learn the other aspects of effective decision making, and which is what my book, book mm-hmm. Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters is all about. We don't get taught 
so many aspects of effective decision making, which is why, you know, you see the, so let's say entrepreneurs, about half of all small businesses fail within the first five mm. years. You know, that that's kind of because they don't make good decisions. They don't make effective decisions. They're not taught how to do this. If you, there was a study uh, by Chung Kamui uh, and Paul Carroll of the 500, of um the corporations from 1981 to 2007 that were worth over 500 million that went bankrupt in the US. And again, this is 2007, so it didn't include the Great Recession. So it wasn't kind of, you know, that big blow. It was just 1981 to 2007. Mm -hmm. What they found was about 46% of these corporations would not have suffered at all if they did if the leadership didn't make really poor strategic decisions. Wow. So it's really coming from strategic decisions that led to clearly, very clearly, completely to bankruptcy. Those corporations would have been fine if they didn't make really poor strategic decisions. So that was uh, 46%. Many of the rest, 54%, would likely have survived if the leadership didn't make really poor strategic decisions. That's a so 46%. That, that's interesting. 46%, Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, Forty-six percent. No, no problem. I mean, it's astounding to me, right? I mean, I'm citing the statistic. It's forty-six percent, just purely due to strategic bad decisions by the leadership, not implementation, not the external context, just bad strategic decisions. It's very sad and it's very frustrating. I mean, that's that's what happens. I mean, I'll give you another example, uh, which one that has to do with a lot of the bad strategic decisions is uh, mergers and acquisitions. Mergers and acquisitions are a really important decision for any company to do a merger and acquisition. But according to extensive research, about 80% of mergers and acquisitions fail. They fail to create value for both companies. They destroy value mm -hmm. instead. So 80% of them fail to create value. And this is, you know, a number of the companies that went bankrupt as there is during that study went bankrupt because of bad mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of them are really ego driven that the, the, the leaders get worked up about, oh, wow, I, I'll have even a bigger organization, more, you know, more market share, more mm -hmm. market cap, more employees, you know, <laughs> more revenues. I'm I'm a big I'm a big cheese or in the the Wall Street <laughs> I'm a big swinging dick of 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 uh, of this company right I think there is something to that and I see this a lot in the workplace I've seen it over the course of many years it's a natural tendency to want to move up the hierarchy of an organization because that means a bigger budget a bigger team etc cetera, etc cetera. bigger is better and i i mm -hmm. agree I, 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 there's something very primal about that you you're moving up the social hierarchy mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we're talking about here mm -hmm. the ego that's an emotional thing that's coming from the emotional place it's coming from your tribal impulse tribal intuitions and so much of what is going on in contemporary businesses are driven by these very powerful primal emotions, by the ego <laughs> desire of moving up the social status, of moving up the social hierarchy. So we see how powerful it is within organizations and out of organizations. And you're right, kind of mergers and acquisitions are often driven by ego rather than by evaluating what would be actually best for the shareholders, what would be best for the stock price of the companies. And that's really very, very dangerous. I mean, look at the combination of Sears and Kmart. I mean, Sears, which became Sears, went bankrupt, I think about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And it went bankrupt partially. I mean, the major, major reason that people attributed to is the, com is the fact that Sears and Kmart combined that they merged together. They were independently already kind of struggling, but when they came together, they <laughs> not only were they kind of two struggling retailers, but they were also working on merging their systems and processes. So their energy was right. occupied by uh, merging their systems and processes instead of competing against Walmart and Target. Mm. <laughs> and uh, that, that, as a result, you know, that was a big, big factor in their eventual bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Well, if there's so much of this data and research around the dangers of poor decision making and kind of tribal emotional decision making, why why do we revere this advice of going with our guts? Why why do we revere business leaders that, you know, that say they go with their guts? What's what's going on there? And why 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 does this advice seem to be you know, ubiquitous around uh, around the world, particularly now when we talk about 
mm-hmm. entrepreneurship and millennials. Yes. The, the, the cool thing is to be an entrepreneur. And yes. if you cite, cite these statistics of, of business failures, I, I scroll through my Instagram feed and I see loads of you know, inspirational quotes and things about, you know, going with your gut and you yes. know, trusting your instincts and blah, 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 blah. Well, why do we revere this stuff so much? So the first thing I want to highlight is that the evidence on all the ways that we've been screwed up or that we're screwed up has been around for a while. So it's been around since the late 1940s when Kahneman and Tversky, who are really the originators, Daniel Kahneman, he is the person who first really used the terminology of system one, system two in his 2011 book, Thinking Fast and Slow, great book, check it out. It's He was part of the first generation of scholars who were looking at how are we screwed up, these mm-hmm. cognitive biases. And the cognitive biases are the specific mistakes that we as human beings tend to make because of how our brains, is wired, brains are wired. A lot of it is due to the evolutionary reasons that I talked about. It's another part of it is due to just to the biological processing of our brains that can't process data effectively. We could talk about that later. So there are over 100 cognitive biases that cause us to make really bad mistakes. Mm-hmm. The over the 30 most dangerous ones for business leaders, businesses, professionals, risk management folks are described in my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And on that, that first generation has been looking at what are the cognitive biases. My generation of scholars, some kind of a second wave of scholars who are, are looking at how to address them, how to solve these problems. And that has only been really coming around the last two decades. So in the last two decades, we've really been learning how do you not simply find out how we're screwed up, mm-hmm. how our brains are screwed up, but how can we fix these problems? And the research is not really popularized. In fact, my book that I mentioned before, Never Go With Your Gut, is the first book to look at this problem and address it in business settings. Uh, you know, there, there have been a couple of books that looked, uh, you know, for example, Dan and Chief Heave's book, Decisive, is quite good. And it looks at life issues. How do you address it in mm. your know, private life, personal life? Um, my previous book, The Truth Seekers Handbook, looks at also personal life. How do you address it there? However, my this new book, Never Go With Your Gut, is the first one to look in, uh, at it in business settings. So it, it's really not has not been popularized. It's not really been out there. This is uh, at the cutting edge of evidence-based business. Mm. And if the evidence, the practice of evidence-based business is kind of like the practice of evidence-based medicine. That has evidence-based medicine has really been around since. 2000 or so we've been really looking at the evidence that's why people don't do things like heart stents anymore or uh, that doctors are now starting and nurses are starting to wash their hands before approaching patients (laughs) you'd Mm. be surprised but Mm. uh, before a number of recent initiatives only about two-thirds of the time would doctors and nurses wash their hands before approaching patients and that was just as early as 2000 and that has changed significantly as a result of it mortality rates have gone way down so many less people dying in hospitals Mm. so this is my book is at the cutting edge of evidence-based business in the same way that evidence-based medicine was the is the hot new thing of the 2000s and people don't know this stuff they just don't they think that going with their gut is the right thing to do and the they unfortunately and it's so easy to do they unfortunately mistake the feeling of something that is not good, they feel good about it, they think that's the right thing to do. And this is something that entrepreneurs, you know, kind of small business owners, startup owners do all the time. Mm-hmm. They say, they think, okay, this is, this feels like the right thing to do. Therefore, I will do it. Mm-hmm. They don't step back and use effective decision-making techniques, which are often very counterintuitive, <laughs> like mm-hmm. going against your intuitions, right? They just think, hey, this is the right thing to do, and I'll go through with it. And they make terrible decisions as a result. I mean, look at WeWork, the company mm-hmm. that was yep. just about six months ago evaluated at, what, something like $75 billion? I think $60 mm-hmm. 90 billion was the general evaluation, so $75 billion on average. Right now, after SoftBank's intervention, it will it's valued at about seven billion. So seven billion is the current valuation <laughs> of WeWork. 
And why did that happen? Well, Adam Newman, the founder of WeWork, the CEO, went forward with the IPO despite lots of people telling him that he shouldn't go forward with the IPO. And what was revealed was the very screwed up governance structure Mm -hmm. of WeWork, where he owned a great deal of shares, a great deal of power. He was engaged in self-dealing, kind of owned some properties, lent them to WeWork as a company, and a lot of other really problematic things. And he had this governance structure because he felt it was the right thing to do. He felt, hey, this is what I feel about the company. You know, I'm the leader. I'm the owner. I can do these things. I can be mm. be whatever I want. And uh, the, all the other people will take it. Well, no. When the investors actually seriously investigated the structure of the company as a part of the effort to go public as part of the IPO, they saw how screwed up the company structure was. And because a lot, a great deal of the trust in the company relied on Adam Newman, relied on the leadership. They saw that the leadership, as exemplified by Adam Newman, is Mm -hmm. really bad. And that's why the valuation went down so rapidly, so quickly. So this is an example of how, I mean, entrepreneur whose company is worth 75 billion is Mm -hmm. now worth, the company is now worth 7 billion as a result of gut reactions and intuitions. But people don't know that. They really don't know this stuff. They don't know that they shouldn't go with their gut. It's it is crazy that we don't know that, and there, there are a number of really interesting things that that we can where we can go around this. Um, one one is the 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 cult around CEOs. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. I, as a management consultant, I was always, oh, we got to get into the C suite. We 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 need to you know the, the, like these people kind of walked on water. You know, if you get a meeting with a CEO, <laughs> right? That that yes, oh, yes. they're they're magical people. They have magical powers, and they you know obviously they don't. But we've we've uh, uh, come to this sort of place where somehow we revere certain certain leaders more than others because they must have some some knowledge or some 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 magic some some something that we some fairy dust that we don't we don't know what it is and actually i think we can start to break that down and that that's really interesting to me um be interesting to get your thoughts on that uh, mm-hmm. but but similarly we also you're right we don't talk about cognitive biases and we I, I want to get into debiasing in a moment, but we we don't talk about cognitive biases. And I've done some web searches, just very simple web searches around which consultancies, big consultancies, can tell me about cognitive biases and the work that I that I do. And I couldn't find much at all, at least not in the kind of risk management space where I work. And it was there, but where was it in the marketing stuff? Marketers know how to mm. manipulate our biases, <laughs> which is interesting. But a lot of the rest of the the business, we we we're, we are we're flying we're flying blind. Yeah. So I, I'd be keen to get any of your thoughts on those two on those two things about revering CEOs and and secondly uh, around uh, the, the, this the sort of absence of thinking about cognitive biases in in business and you know where that comes from as well. So what we need to understand in terms of the in terms of the CEOs, there's a lot of the, the CEOs in our current environment are the same thing as the alpha males in the tribal mm. savage environment. So we have this feeling toward them. We revere them just as we used to revere kings, barons, leaders, you know, the alpha males. It's crazy. Of, yes. <laughs> you know, the, the yesteryear. And of course, before that, the strongest male in the tribe who would lead the tribe into war, mm. right? Kind of that was, you know, the, the, of the 15 people who was the strongest male or 150 people who was the strongest male, right? Kind of that big, tall person. I mean, uh, CEOs on average tend to be much taller than the average person. That's for interesting. Example. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, look at the, look at the statistics. Tend to be much taller than the average person. Why is that? We associate height with power, and people get promoted because they are associated with power. So, these CEOs often make terrible decisions. If you look at the track record of CEOs, you'll often see that they make really bad decisions. But they often aren't punished for their bad decisions. I mean, let's go look at again at Adam Newman. He got away with a golden parachute of about two billion dollars. So one point. Nine million, one point nine. No, I'm sorry, one point seven billion dollars. So he was bought out with that money, and now he's starting a new company with that money. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, all, all of these. You'll you'll 
there are many, 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 many examples of CEOs who were made really bad decisions, and then they kept getting bonuses, they kept, you know, getting promotions, uh, they became the heads of other companies, because right now they're in the public platform, and they can really... First of all, they're great at spinning. Mm-hmm. Part big reason why people become CEOs is the marketing aspects of things. They're not necessarily great at decision making, but they're great at representing themselves really well. So if you look at the interviews, if you look at the interview process, you look at the unstructured interviews, you'll see that unstructured interviews where you just uh, come in and talk to a person about whether they should be employed, about whether to employ them, is actually completely not predictive of their success in the job. Mm-hmm. It's just predictive of how good they are at selling themselves in person. A lot of CEOs are great at selling themselves. They're not great at all at running the company. They can hire people who are run the company. That's the COO, the operations person, but they're often not great at running the company, unfortunately. So a lot of CEOs are hired because they're great at representing themselves well. And it's you'll see that, <laughs> the, in, in fact, the more arrogant and overconfident the CEO is, the more popular they are. So really? the more they are seen as a strong leader, yes, the because they represent themselves in a strong way. So they're seen as a strong leader. But you'll also see in the evidence-based business research, you'll see studies showing that those are the companies that tend to have the least profitability. Or the more arrogant a CEO is, uh, and there are a number of studies by, you know, let's say how many articles are written about the CEO, how much time does the CEO spend on company internal company business versus, you know, doing speeches mm-hmm. and so on. Uh, the more they tend to do speeches, the more they tend to do public activities, the less profit the company tends to have. <laughs> wow. I, I, and, I know that there's a higher percentage of psychopaths and uh, is it psychopaths and narcissists in the CEO population as well. Um, sure. That uh, yes. must be the same, the same dynamic. Although you could also argue that some of that is necessary for a big public corporation to meet with investors and uh, shareholders and customers and uh, all kinds of and do media appearances, etc. That that's a fundamental part of what mm-hmm. they do. But uh, yeah, I, I, it is it is a very interesting dynamic. Um, I, I want yes, to talk about an unfortunate one. Yeah, it is. It, it, it certainly, it certainly is. Maybe there's an idea there for for, for a keen uh, listener about shorting companies with uh, based on media appearances and arrogance of, of CEOs. That might be an interesting oh, some uh, people, investment oh, proposition. Some people do. So yeah, smart sure investors. Yeah, smart short investors actually use these studies and they mm. uh, use it to short companies. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting. Could we talk about debiasing? And I keep. Uh, yes, I, 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 you know, the, the, there's a lot of stuff now, uh, more stuff now about cognitive biases, and there's there's stuff, uh, as you say, written about uh, biases, cognitive biases in our personal lives, and ways to debias and and having, uh, for example, uh, critical friends, uh, people that um, that that you can bring in and ask certain questions, certain techniques, but in the world of of business. How would you spot and how would you debias decision making? What are, what are some of the things that you've you've come across, and what does the the scientific literature say? Yes. So the first thing I just want to make sure to hit your mm. uh, not about the consulting. There are some con- uh, there are some consultants for the biasing. In fact. Mm-hmm. My company, DisasterAvoidanceExperts.com, which does this, actually shows up on the front page of Google when you search consulting okay. cognitive bias. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> cool. So I'm pleased with that. But uh, so that's kind of one thing I, I want to do mention. There are some people who actually work on this. Now, how you actually address this in business settings is the area of my fascination. That's kind of mm-hmm. what the essence of my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. How you solve these things. That's kind of my generation scholars. How do you solve these serious, serious problems in your decision making? So let's, let's go. Uh, I'll give a couple of case. I'll start with a case study to give an illustration and then we can go mm-hmm. to some broad principles. So let me give you a case study of one example with the planning fallacy. Planning fallacy is one of the worst, one of the worst, fall- one of the worst cognitive biases in business leadership. Now, the planning fallacy is basically that 
idea that we make plans as though they will come correct, as though they will come true. Mm -hmm. And we make plans as though we are perfect and the plans are perfect and the company is perfect and everything will, will go well. Mm -hmm. Because we that's the way we feel about ourselves. Our intuitive feelings about ourselves is that we are good, the, the company is good, you know, everything will be good. And that's how we feel and that's the plans we make and we invest our resources of time, money, social capital, whatever, accordingly. Now. That pretty much never happens. <laughs> the mm -hmm. plans never actually turn out the way they do. And then you know, plans don't survive contact with the enemy. But people keep doing these plans, which is kind of, in a way, ridiculous. People doing, do, keep doing strategic planning. The plans don't work out. You know, they, There's the famous phrase, you know, just as famous as never go with your gut, perhaps, as go with your gut, uh, perhaps, is failing to plan is planning to fail. Mm -hmm. So again, failing to plan is planning to fail. You've probably heard this phrase. It's very misleading. It's very unfortunate because it gives people that false sense of comfort and security. It gives them that false sense of comfort and security. Just like doing a SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's a really problematic strategic technique because it gives people that sense of false comfort and security. When people do SWOT analysis, inevitably, when you know I work with companies, when mm -hmm. I look at their previous SWOT analysis that they did, they inevitably list way too many strengths, way too many opportunities, way too few weaknesses, way too few threats, and they get really a lot of problems from it in the end because they don't address the kind of issues that will rise up. Mm -hmm. So a much more effective technique to address the planning fallacy and these tendencies in our minds to be excessively optimistic, excessively confident about the future is to have the phrase failing to plan for problems is planning to fail again mm -hmm. failing to plan for problems is planning to fail so how do you address the planning fallacy you understand that you will have many more problems than you intuitively feel you will so again many more problems so what you need to do is look back at the past what happened in the past? What kind of problems did you run into in the past? And it's kind of silly that people in doing their strategic planning, they don't look at this. They don't look at the past. They only look at the future. And they don't think about, you know, how did, the, how did this project grow up in the past? Um, mm -hmm. I was working with a manufacturing client in Pittsburgh, which is a mid-sized city in the United States. And uh, they were telling me that, hey, you know, he, they do heavy equipment manufacturing, so every kind of project they take on is maybe two to three million, you know, in the millions of dollars. Two to three million is pretty typical. And uh, they were saying that, you know, hey, we take on a project, we think it's going to take two million, and it takes three million. We think it's going to take five million, it's going to take, it takes seven million. So this was a, as a result of a training I was doing. And I was talking to the leader of the company, and he was kind of saying, yes, we, we experienced a planning fallacy. And I talked with him, hey, why don't you look back at, this is a really effective technique, look back at the previous projects, see what went wrong, incorporate it into the future projects. And he, and he was looking at me, it's like, oh, well, that kind of seems obvious, but we've never done that before. Mm. <laughs> Hmm. They've never they've never done this before. It seems obvious now that I say it. Uh, that's what he said. But things that seem obvious now that I say it are really things that aren't obvious. That means that they're not obvious people will be doing them. So that's one of the things you need to do. Look back at the previous problems, incorporate that into your future activities. So what happened in the past? What can you address it? How you can address it in the future? Second, Think about the possible problems that might come up, both internally and externally with the company. What might come up with internally? So don't uh, think that, you know, just everything will be hunky-dory, everything will be going well. Think about what might go wrong. I mean, let's say Uber. Uber is a very famous case where the internal culture turned out to be pretty toxic and a lot of sexual harassment claims were not addressed that should have been addressed. Mm. So, uh, so um the CEO and other leadership members as part of the Me Too movement, when that became really prominent, they were, for, they were forced to resign because they weren't accepting the internal culture. So what happened is that they didn't notice a change in the external context where sexual harassment became a much bigger mm -hmm. deal than it used to be. And they didn't address things with internally in the company or the sexual harassment in the company in a timely manner. So that's another example where people didn't, didn't notice a change, they couldn't, and they didn't address these threats. So think about external context. What might be a threat for you there? And internally, what might be a threat for you internally? So, so for example, 
are you relying on some key employees right now? And do you have a backup plan for what happens when they leave? I mean, what fund gets prototypically hit by a bus, right? Somebody gets hit by a bus. What are you going to do with that key employee? Do you have a succession plan? That's just one example. There are so many other examples. So think about all the problems that might happen internally and externally and think about ways you can address them. So, of course, with key employees, very easy thing to do is to create a succession plan for each one and make sure that the processes, the systems that that employee uses that uh, they use to manage whatever they're doing in your company are written down, that there's a clear understanding of what that person is doing, how they're doing it. So you have a process. Uh, same thing, look, monitor what's going on outside your company. You know, are there might there be more negative consequences from the trade wars and tariffs? How can you address that going forward? You can probably manage your supply chains for them to be not as threatened by future tariff situations. That's another example of what you can do. So you can address these problems in the future. And the same thing with opportunities. The one of the things that people don't realize is that failing to take advantage of an opportunity can be just as bad as having a serious problem. So look at opportunities, look at what opportunities you might be missing and how you can take advantage of them. Think about it, you know, maybe your competitor is likely to go bankrupt or, you know, so, some or lose a major client. Think about how you can take advantage of that major client being lost. Think about what kind of resources you need to use to if your competitor might be going bankrupt. So look at, reserve some resources in advance. There are some, there are going to be some problems and some opportunities that you're not going to anticipate. So you want to reserve some resources, not invest all your resources into the plan, but reserve some resources for unexpected opportunities uh, and unexpected threats. And that's a really effective way of addressing the planning fallacy, what I just said. All of those things, that's those are the kind of techniques that have been shown to be very effective in addressing the planning fallacy. Yeah, and I think what's important as well is how an organization does some of this stuff. Because if you just group a group of five executives, their bonuses depend on getting this deal done, which might be a risky deal, then you're probably not going to leave that room mm. with the right answer. <laughs> and And therefore, having, I always believe in, having external experts come in and provide a view and particularly around the external environment. So one of the things when I was a management consultant, if you work with oil executives, they'll, they'll be all over the oil price, you know, oil price assumptions around a new project like that, that will, that's bread and butter to them. But if you, I don't know, if you talk to them about changing uh, political dynamics in a country or region or social dynamics in a local community in which they have a big project. They, they, you, they're not going to have much to say about those things. And you get this sort <laughs> of, uh, you're probably very familiar with the bike shedding effect, the bike shed effect. Yes. Uh, where, yes. Yeah, where folks just talk about the thing that they understand and they ignore everything, everything else. And so mm -hmm. I think yep. Ha yep. having um, external experts come in and inject a bit of independent challenge, maybe not just for the planning fallacy, but for anything really, is a really good way of, of, of trying to address some of these techniques. That's definitely very effective. So having someone external come in and address that, uh, I recommend to people another way of doing that mm -hmm. is to have someone inside the company who is mm -hmm. designated as the devil's advocate right, sort of persona, right. mm -hmm. who is specifically rewarded and promoted based on their ability to be critical. Mm -hmm. So you you don't you want to be able to have definitely rely on some external con, uh, people who come in and challenge things, whether it's a consultants, coaches, whether it's someone from your board of advisors who the board of directors perhaps who doesn't have a stake in the current mm -hmm. decision, who just cares about the company as a whole. So kind of external, internal, but also somebody who's internal within the company who is rewarded for critical criticizing what's going on. And that's very challenging because you all will, another cognitive bias. So you, you talked about bike shedding already. Another cognitive bias, which is a big problem, is called the mom effect, mm. where or the shoot the messenger effect, that's kind mm -hmm. of the colloquial name, mm -hmm. where people who convey negative or critical information up the chain of command or you know, in a meeting of fellow executives tend to get uh, shot. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. tend to uh, <laughs> lose their status. They tend to lose their reputation. So the smart leadership of a company 
actually promotes and supports people who provide constructive critical feedback, people who actually give criticism of current plans and whose job it is, who are designated to do that, to address these problems. And they are praised, both publicly praised, promoted and given other sort of incentives because really people do things based on incentives. Mm. So you want to make sure they get incentives that are tied really to what what they want to achieve in their career. Not simply say, you know, this is good, we're, we're not going to shoot the messenger, but in reality, this is what happens in very many companies. And I just want to say that I, I've seen this happen way too many times. So I want to bring this out. The leadership says, you know, my door is open, come in, give mm. me constructive critical feedback anytime. And in eight out of 10 cases, <laughs> the person who gives constructive critical feedback gets later, um, uh, that results in that turns out to be a career limiting move. Yep. Yep. A CLA. Yeah. <laughs> and that's CLM, sorry. Yep. 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 Exactly. So that is a big problem for companies. And what you want to be able to do is actually uplift people, specifically give them go against this tendency, give them specific rewards, praise, public recognition for giving constructive critical feedback encourage that within the company. So that is a much more effective approach to Mm -hmm. addressing the situation. So you can both internal and external people on especially bigger projects. You definitely want those external people on smaller projects. You want internal people, you know, so that that's kind of something that uh, you want to be thinking about. Yeah, that's all great stuff. In your book, you have a number of steps around Mm -hmm how to how to make an effective decision and i th- i th- what i wanted to just touch on uh and and we we can touch on all all the steps but what i actually want to touch on is you've got going back to the sort of system 1 system 2 thing those eight steps they're great if you know your organization has a big decision to make a big investment a big hire a big strategic move etc but uh, you can't apply that level of rigor necessarily to kind mm-hmm. of daily, day to day type of decision. And so, how do you? Dis- but how do you distinguish? How do you get to that point where you, you you might have a very critical decision that you don't know is a very critical decision, and you need to put a little bit of rigor mm-hmm. around it? So, a very effective way to do that is to use a technique. To use a technique that takes less than five minutes. Mm-hmm. The one that you mentioned, the eight step, that's for big decisions. Mm-hmm. That takes you know 45 minutes at least to, to go through that. But there's a technique that takes less than five minutes and that should be applied to any decision you don't want to screw up on an everyday level. Whether you're writing an important email, preparing for an, an important e-meeting, deciding on which uh, w- deciding on which uh, client to invest your time and resources in more or less, decide which vendor to use for not non-critical supplies. There's a technique you can use that takes less than five minutes. And that's to ask five questions that avoid decision disasters. So here are the five questions mm-hmm. to avoid decision disasters. First question, what important information did I not yet fully consider? Again, what important information did I not yet fully consider? Why is that an important question? Well, because of a, one of our problematic modes of thinking is called the confirmation bias, where we tend to ignore information that doesn't fit our beliefs and looking for information that does fit our beliefs. So what we tend to do is we feel a certain choice is right and certain information is right, and we go with that choice and we rely on that information. That question, what important information do I not yet fully consider, should be used to look for information that disconfirms your preferred choice. Mm. Again, information that would question, would disconfirm, go against your preferred choice. If you can't disconfirm it, that's great. So then you go forward, ask ask the next question. But you want to try to look for information that disconfirms your preferred choice. That's first. Mm -hmm. Second question, what dangerous judgment errors cognitive biases that I not here address. Again, what dangerous judgment errors that I not here address. As you know by now, my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, goes for the 30 most dangerous ones for business leaders. You can also take a look on Wikipedia. There's over 100 of them, not specifically for businesses, but uh, they give you an idea of what they are. Third, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? Mm. Again, 
a trusted and objective advisor, what would they suggest you do? So, you know, think about a little bit, you know, Ben on your shoulder. What would mm-hmm. Ben suggest you do? What would somebody you trust suggest you do? So that's the third question. And now, probably someone that doesn't the, necessarily have a, have a stake in the outcome. They can be objective. Yes, so, that's why they're yep, objective. Yep, right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's, the, what, that's why they're objective. Mm-hmm. So again, somebody from outside, somebody internally who doesn't have a stake in the decision. Now, those three are about making the decision. We're transitioning. The last two are more about implementing it. How have I addressed all the ways this decision could fail? Again, how have I addressed all the ways this decision could fail? That is a really critical question. I mentioned it before. Look at all the threats. Look at all the opportunities. You can fail by not taking advantage of opportunities. You can fail by failing to address a threat. And if you can, that would help you know how to invest your resources effectively and problem solve all the issues in advance. Finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? Again, Mm -hmm. what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? This is a critical question to ask at the beginning in the decision making stage. You don't want to be in the middle of a decision, implementing the decision and be deciding whether you should change your mind if you can help it. Because when you're actually implementing the decision, you are in a hot state, you're in a raw state, you're Mm -hmm. attached to the decision, you're really invested in it. It's much better to decide in advance what would cause you to change your mind. So those five questions, I mean, I talked them through. It took less than three minutes for me to talk them through. It takes three, It takes less than five minutes for you to ask and answer these questions. If for the, you know, you likely discover that your decision is right. If you discover that your decision is not right, it's very much worth it to take more time and invest more time mm-hmm. into addressing the decision. And that sometimes you'll discover that the decision is serious, is more serious than you think. And that's when it's the time to go to the eight step model, mm-hmm. the more thorough eight step model that Ben mentioned earlier that you want to use for more serious, sizable decisions. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, I like the the last one a lot because sometimes we reopen decisions that should be closed already. We've decided, so why are we going back? Mm-hmm. And there, are, there, there's a point perhaps when we should go back when we've done the thing that we said we're going to do, and let's see how it worked out. But uh, you know, it, it, it reopening something is never a good thing. It's very painful. Mm-hmm. It is it, it, it is very painful. So that's why that question is really good to have a set point. So, for example, let's say you launch a new product uh, and uh, you say in three months, does it hit 4.5 million in profit? If it hits 4.5 million in profit, we're good, we're golden, we'll keep going. If it doesn't, we're going to revisit it and revise the situation. Mm-hmm. Now, if you have that approach, then you could spend those three months doing your best doing your best to make sure the product hits 4.5 million as opposed to thinking and wondering, well, is it, you know, is it hitting that the numbers? Is it not? How's it going? Should we revise things? Yeah. You never, you know, you have a point. No, it's, it's, I, I, I like, I liken it to looking at the scoreboard every 30 seconds. If you're playing a, you know, football (laughs) match, right. You can, you won't play the football match and, and it can be quite, you know, it can be quite frustrating when, when also you're working in an environment like that, like, Tell me your, you know, your numbers uh, as of, you know, this afternoon. Okay, tell me your numbers as of this yesterday. You know, this sort of thing. You, you go crazy. Yes. What, and what you're talking about here? So the five questions. I want to get into the, the eight steps in a, in a moment. But th- this is all decision quality. And if you've mm-hmm. been through a process and you know that you made a quality decision, you know, we can't control outcomes, we can't control events, but we can control decision quality. And Mm -hmm. if you've made a quality decision, then you should feel comfortable that you can go ahead and execute on on the decision. And sometimes you make a quality decision, it doesn't work out. And this is a great concept that I, uh, Annie Duke is a former World Series of Poker champion, and I've had her on the podcast. and, And she introduces this concept in the in the world of poker it's very tricky there as well because you can play the right hand but lose or play the wrong hand but Mm -hmm. win and attribute luck to something that is actually skill and vice versa and Mm -hmm. if if i love the idea of having these five questions eight steps because it's a way of checking in on decision quality absolutely decision quality is so so important and in fact the uh, penultimate the one before last chapter Mm -hmm. in my book talks about the what the Annie Duke talks about the poker and uh, it was discovered of course much earlier by 
people like Kahneman and Hearst, mm -hmm, called mm -hmm. outcome bias, yes. where we tend to judge a decision by the outcome of the decision. That's very, very bad, mm -hmm. judging the decision by the outcome of the decision, because often we can't control the outcome. There's a big element of luck in mm -hmm. the outcome. So you want to look at the quality of the decision-making process. How well did people make these decisions? One of the things that uh, my clients do, I give them out a small, I give them out the five questions to avoid decision disasters on a small tent paper that all of their employees place in front of their the, of their computers that they use at work and then they ask these questions about every decision that they need to make then if one of these decisions goes wrong <laughs> the supervisor can go and say hey did you ask the five questions what did you answer to those five questions mm -hmm. if they discover that the five questions were asked that they did a you know serious job of going five questions, then fine. You know sometimes bad luck happens and it's okay. But if they didn't ask one of these questions, that's when they can kind of you know have some negative consequences for having a poor decision process. The same thing happens during meetings. The five questions uh, I hear clients tell me save so much time during meetings because mm. everyone comes to them having answered those questions, thought about them for themselves, and then those five questions just structure the agenda very naturally. You talk about these five questions, you talk them through, and then you come to a decision outcome as a result of the five questions. Saves a lot of time and hassle. Yeah. We've dangled this sort of carrot of the eight step decision making model. I know we're we're running out of time, but I'd I'd love for you to just touch on what those eight sure. steps are without, you know, without having a uh, people can buy the book obviously and and get get into the the <laughs> details, but um but but what how do how do the eight steps differ from the five questions? So the eight steps are for much more thorough and serious decisions and when you discover using the five questions Sometimes you'll know in advance, you know, you're launching a major project. That obviously is going to be something that you need to have a serious decision-making process for. You're deciding to move your headquarters or something. You're hiring a new CEO, mm -hmm. something like that. That's serious. Sometimes you'll discover in the process that of asking the five questions that a decision is more serious than you realized. And that's when you'll want to take the 45 minutes instead of, you know, the three minutes to mm -hmm. ask the questions. You want to take the 45 minutes to go through the process first. Identify the first uh, step. Identify the need for a decision to be made. It's very easy to not make, to not identify really important decisions. For example, consider Kodak. Kodak actually invented the digital camera in 1984, but they wow. shelved the plan for the know that camera too. because, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The engineer and Kodak invented yeah. the right. digital camera. Right. They, sh they, they shelved the plans for digital camera and others invented digital cameras because Kodak was making much more money on film. And eventually others overtook Kodak in digital camera production, whereas Kodak stuck to film. And uh, eventually Kodak went bankrupt because it chose not to go into the digital camera, which was obviously the way of the future, as we know now. So they missed the need for a decision to be made. They failed to take the step. They just went along their merry process and didn't realize that they needed to make a decision to change their strategy. Second, gather relevant information from a variety of informed perspectives on the issue at hand. You'll want to focus especially on people who disagree with you. Don't look only at the yes people who agree with you. Mm -hmm. Look at people who disagree with you and gather inf uh, their perspectives so that you can get the benefit of their expertise. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go with them, but you want to listen to them. Next, decide on the goals you want to reach and paint a clear picture of the desired outcome. Often people go forward, you know, let's say with a merger, they don't know what goals they want to reach. They just want to be bigger. They just want mm. growth. And growth at the expense of profitability is often very, very bad, as Uber, Lyft, you know, WeWork and others are finding out right now. Mm. <laughs> so you want to make a decision about the specific clear goals that you want to reach, paint a clear vision of the future so that you know when you're reaching that, or you know when you're deviating away from it. Then... Develop clear decision-making criteria to evaluate options. So that's the fourth one. Clear decision-making criteria and evaluate how strong which one is. So, for example, I mentioned if you're hiring a new CEO, if, you know, one of the things you might want to think about is the CEO's salary demands. Obviously, that's a big one. Hmm. Another one is... Uh, their fit into your company culture. How well would they fit the company culture? How representative are they? Third, you know, maybe something like how technically competent are they in your field? 
forth? What kind of connections do they have? What kind of network do they bring? And then you want to weigh these. How important is salary? How important is their competence? How important is their fit? And so on. Mm -hmm. So that you know what's important and how relevant it is. Then generate viable options that can achieve your goals. (laughs) This is a big, big, big one. Uh, And I can tell you, especially for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs tend to settle way too often Mm. for the first thing that seems to make sense. Mm. They just go, okay, this makes sense. Let me go on to the next step. And they don't think nearly enough about how the long term impact of this choice. They generate just the first viable option as opposed to the best option. Sometimes it's very much worth it to take that extra five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, hour, day, week to figure out what is the best option. You'll often see big companies making a very bad choice with generating viable options when their CEOs leave within the one or two years. You you never want the CEO to leave within one or two years. You want the CEO to stay for definitely at least five years, ideally 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, GE has recently made some really screwed up decisions about CEOs who had to leave within you know, a year. So that's an example of where you want to generate viable options. Next, weigh these options and pick the best of the bunch. So evaluate using the decision making criteria, you know, how important, how, what is the salary requirements, what's their fit and so on. Use the decision making criteria to weigh these options and choose whoever seems best fit for the CEO role. You know, if you're moving to a new city, what the new city is, if you want to launch a new project, a new product, what the best product is to launch. Next, of course, seventh, implement the option you choose. So, again, Mm -hmm. as part of that, think about what can go wrong, how you can guard against that and think about what can go right. What kind of opportunities might arise that you're not thinking about and how you can seize them. And finally, eight, evaluate the implementation process. That's the evaluation step and revise as needed. You Mm -hmm. don't want to just say i made a decision, I'm going ahead with it, but you want to evaluate how well it's going for yep. you. And we mentioned that the new information will cause me to revisit this decision question and revise this needed. So that's the eight steps that you want to take for serious, significant decisions. That's cool. And that's a great way of you know looking back and going through those eight steps and, and then making a, a judgment as to did we make a, a quality decision or not? And, you know, mm-hmm. if we, if we didn't, then, you know, what should we, what should we do? So that's, that's great. I, uh, I love all that stuff and there's, uh, we can, we can dig into lots of it, but we're, <laughs> I'm conscious of your time. I did want to cover off one thing, at least mm-hmm. one thing further. And, and that is that, you know, there are, I think there are moments and there are lots of moments, maybe daily where you do need to check in with your, your instinct, your gut feel. Mm-hmm. And to be very clear, you're not saying don't listen to your gut. You're, you're saying don't just rely on your gut to make your decision. An, an example might be, you know, around some ethical decision that you need to make or that a, your company needs to make. And sometimes you might check in and say, well, that doesn't feel right when it comes to, you know, our values for, f- mm-hmm. for example. And I'm not sure that we should be doing that. Or if there are certain gray areas about doing something that might be, you know, might be outright illegal, or it might be just, again, unethical. Mm-hmm. That's one example. There are countless other examples yes. where there are certain things our instincts are might be telling us that are very important. Also, creativity and sense of curiosity, where good mm-hmm. ideas come from, that, that you never know that a great, great idea just sort of pops up and it's important to explore that. So I just want to clarify mm-hmm. that you're not saying don't listen to your instinct at all. What you're saying is don't just rely on your instinct to make decisions. Absolutely. So this is one of the central things that you want to be thinking about. You never want to simply trust your gut. That's why the book is called Never Go With Your Gut. You always want to check with your head. Mm-hmm. You know, Bernie Ebers and other leaders at WorldCom and so on, and uh, you know, right in, re- recently Mark Newman and WeWork, were all going with their instincts when they made their decisions. Mm-hmm. And those instincts led them into a bad direction. I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, my instinct often leads me into a bad direction because I'm a person who's an optimist. So I think things are going great. I think that my ideas are wonderful. I think I'm risk blind (laughs) and that I tend to be risk blind. You know, I tend to not notice risks. So 
if I just have you know all of these great ideas and I just go forward with them, mm -hmm. that's going to be a very serious problem for me. I'm very creative as a person, but I need to run my ideas by someone who is more pessimistic and someone who is more skeptical in order to filter my mm -hmm. great creative ideas into something that actually works. Yeah. So that's an example where I use the strategy. You know, I listen to my intuitions and I say, hey, here are my intuitions. That's great. Now let me check with my head. And the way I check with my head in terms of, let's say, creating ideas is by running them by somebody and a trusted and objective advisor, question free of the five questions to avoid decision disasters. Mm -hmm. So that's the principle, fundamental principle. Never simply go with your gut. Always check with your head because your gut can't be trusted to make the right decisions. Your head needs to be involved in order to filter the decisions in order to change those autopilot reactions actions into something that is you want to make sure is healthy and fits with your goals. Cool. Yeah, that's that's great. And I just wanted to also touch on this concept that is in your book around mental fitness as well, that sometimes mm. we need to think clearly and the way in which we are, you know, our headspace might be, might be wrong for a number of reasons. We could be, you know, angry about something that's happening in our personal lives or we just might be tired, we haven't slept enough, we haven't eaten the right mm -hmm. food, uh, we haven't exercised, all of those kinds of things. And I also find that that's something that gets lost in the business world. What is our mind and body dynamic? How are we feeling? Are we in a physical and mental state to make the right decision? I don't know what yes, you have so some thoughts around that is... and that concept of mental fitness to me really sure. struck me. I, I wrote about it, right? I do have some thoughts around it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yes, we we think about physical fitness a lot, or, you know, I mm -hmm. do. How well am I doing with my body? How how much exercise do I do? What do I eat? You know, all, all of these things. We think about it a lot, and it's kind of an accepted part of our, our culture. We don't think about mental fitness nearly enough. Mm -hmm. We don't think, and because we don't differentiate who we are from our mind. We don't differentiate those things. We just think we are our mind, whereas mm. the, our mind is a very complex set of processes and dynamics and what's going on. Just like we are not our body, we are not our mind. <laughs> Yeah. And our mind is very complex, just like our body is very complex. So mental fitness, I talk about that as a way of understanding, distancing yourself from your intuitions and your emotions and your thoughts and your reasoning and your feelings and recognizing that all of those are just components are just things, processes going on within you. And in order to get yourself physically fit, you go to the gym, you work out, you exercise, you have the right food. You need to do the same, exactly the same things to get yourself mentally fit you don't want to have just you know feed yourself a random diet of tv and junk mm -hmm. and whatever <laughs> you mm -hmm. want to of uh, you know i like low cats as much as the next person but uh, you know i don't want to watch more than check out that for more than 15 minutes a day <laughs> mm -hmm. so you want to think about getting yourself mentally fit and what's and you want to plan for your mental fitness just like you have a plan for your physical fitness whether it's gym, walking exercise. I mean, I go walking with my wife every day, for example. So you want to think about mental fitness. You want to think about your mind. You want to exercise it just as much and get it as fit as you do your body. You So that's a major, major emphasis. A lot of business leaders make terrible decisions about their mental fitness. Again, we'll go to, back to Elon Musk. He is notorious as someone who sleeps very, very little. Mm -hmm. And he is proud of that. You know, I sleep very little. I don't exercise and whatnot. And unfortunately, when we don't sleep enough, it feels like we slept enough. So mm. people who typically get you know, six hours of sleep, four to six hours of sleep, they'll say, oh, I'm fine. I don't need more sleep. In reality, when we do cognitive tests on those folks, they perform much worse than people who sleep eight to 10 hours. Mm. So that means that they make terrible decisions that way more than offset their less uh, time. You know, If you make decisions that are 30% worse and you have two or two more hours of work per day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you have uh, much more time to screw things up. Um, exactly, exactly. You're yeah. absolutely right. So you don't want to place yourself in that position. You don't want to trust your intuitions about what is the right amount of sleep for you. You want to trust the base rate. The base rate is what the research suggests is mm -hmm. the right amount of sleep for the average person. So all of these things are about getting yourself as mentally fit as possible and in order to make the best decisions for yourself, for your company, your career, your finances, and of course, your personal life as well. And before we go, uh, if there are 
people that are listening to this and they have to make a tough personal decision, would these techniques also be as equally applicable to uh, the personal context or is there is there some difference? They would be equally applicable to the personal context. And I actually, my next book, Blind Spots Between Us, <laughs> is actually focusing on relationships, personal relationships. It's coming out in April 2020. So you, you can be on the lookout for that, the blind spots between us. They apply equally as well to personal relationships, to your personal health, to, I mean, civic life, political life. They apply to everything because decisions, the heart of this thing is decisions. Mm -hmm. What decisions can we take? The book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters is focused on organizations, leaders, and so on. But you can apply these same techniques to other settings as well. Cool. We've covered a lot and I can keep going, but I want to be respectful of your time. Was there anything that we didn't get a chance to cover that you wanted to mention? Oh, I think we did a really great job of covering this stuff. Thank you, Ben, for raising really important points. And uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, oh, well, the, there was one thing I wanted yeah. to mention. The book talks about 12 mental habits that you can develop. Okay. So the 12 mental habits, 12 mental skills, I'm not going to go into them right now. I know we're running short on time. So <laughs> no, but, you, I mean, uh, if, the, if you have, if you can stay Hey, I, I'm very happy to, to talk about them or to just run through, have you run through them because I think my, my listeners will, be fine, will find them very valuable. Sure. So these are 12 mental habits that you want to be able to use in order to make the best decisions possible. So this is and mental fitness. In not, is it? The, I talked about the techniques. Yep. I, I talked about the techniques. And uh -huh. these are mental habits that okay. you incorporate. The, these are the ways that you change your autopilot system, your system one, okay. into a more healthy system, okay. into one that actually makes the right decisions. So th these are mental habits that you build up. Habit formation, it takes, just to be very clear, it's very easy and simple to use techniques. I told you, one takes three minutes, the other takes 45 minutes. Mm. Very simple and easy to use. The, these mental habits take a while to integrate into yourself, as any habit does, as it takes a while to learn how to brush your teeth or eat with a fork and knife or learn how to drive a car. So just letting you know that these are mental habits that you build up. First, you want to identify, make a plan to address dangerous judgment errors. Mm -hmm. So you want to learn how to identify them within yourself. And that's a practical habit that you develop on a daily level. How do you identify what dangerous judgment errors you're most prone to? The book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, has a chapter at the very end that has an assessment that helps you assess what kind of dangerous judgment errors you're most prone to and those on your team and your organization are most prone to. So you want to identify them within yourself and look out for them. Second, delay decision making. What your mom told you about counting to 10, you know, uh, mm. that's a, actually a pretty good habit. Count to 10 before making any intuitive jumps, decisions, and so on. Because that's it takes us a little bit of time to turn on our intentional system and make a more reasoned decision. And delaying your decision making will help you with that. Next, meditation. Meditation is, you know, good for a lot of things. One of the things it's good for is building up your focus, mm -hmm. your willpower. And your willpower is what you'll need to have in order to improve your decision making. So that's really important as a strategy. So meditation. Then probabilistic thinking. Thinking in numbers, we tend to be very binary, the very black and white. Mm -hmm. Either something will happen or not happen, either it's 0% or 100%. Mm -hmm. You want to not think that way. You want to develop a thought pattern where, hey, maybe something is 20% likely to happen. Maybe something is 60% likely to happen, 80% likely to happen. The book talks about how to develop that thought pattern. It's very not intuitive. It's very not natural. It's just like eating with a fork and knife. Yeah, very it's not very natural, unnatural, isn't but it? But it's something that's... yeah. No, I was just yeah. going to say it's very unnatural but, unless that, and that's why poker the poker the game of poker is very interesting because it, it's it's a poker players have developed that. Yes, they do and that is a very healthy mental habit for decision making. Then make predictions about the future. This is a wonderful way of calibrating okay. yourself. Mm -hmm. Are you too optimistic? Are you too pessimistic? Mm. What kind of 
judgment errors do you tend to fall into? By making predictions about what will happen in the future and then looking back at them, not just letting them you know, stay there, by looking back at them, you can make effective, you can learn where you're miscalibrated and how to improve it. Then consider alternative explanations and options. If you want to merge or merge with a company, let's say, consider whether there are other companies that might be better or maybe you shouldn't merge with it at all. Consider all of these questions to go against the confirmation bias. Then consider your past experiences. We already talked about that. We tend to not pay nearly enough attention to the past experiences that we had with projects, with anything, and that will help you address planning fallacy and so many others. Then consider the long-term future and repeating scenarios. We tend to be very short-term oriented, and that's a very unfortunate tendency. It's a very savanna, natural, primitive, intuitive tendency. Mm -hmm. In the savanna, it was very important for us to just be short-term oriented. You know, we couldn't store resources. We didn't have a fridge. <laughs> so you want to think about the long-term future and making sacrifices for the long-term future because we tend to overemphasize the short-term gains intuitively and naturally over long-term ones. Next. Consider other people's perspectives. Have a mental habit of considering other people's perspectives. What might they be thinking about? So Ben outlined how you can effectively provide constructive critical feedback for someone. That's not natural and intuitive at all to provide constructive critical feedback that way. The natural thing is to say, do it this way, not that way. Mm -hmm. Instead of here's the here's the behavior, here's the evidence, here's um, what, how we might be better, maybe let's collaborate together about creating a plan for the future. We want to consider other people's perspectives in all sorts of situations. Mm -hmm. 10, use an outside view to get an external perspective. That's very similar to what would a trusted and objective advisor mm -hmm. suggest I do, but it can also involve yourself. Step outside the situation. So if you, again, let's use the example of having um, a CEO, hiring a CEO. You know that people who tend to be very out there in the media, who tend to be very self-aggrandizing, they have lower profits for the company. <laughs> so if you are going to hire that CEO, no matter if the CEO is very impressive in person, very charming, very charismatic, if you know that this person is very self-aggrandizing, not likely to improve the profits for your company, so you might want to skip to the next guy <laughs> or yeah. girl. Yeah, I, I like that you, use, you can use an outside view and it can be yourself, like uh, a, a technique like writing a letter to yourself or something something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. That, that's another technique, yes. So there are lots of ways of implementing this, but cool. the broader principle is using an outside view. Then set a policy to guide your future mm. self and organizations. This is really helpful. If you want to make a commitment, for example, to orienting toward the long term over the short term, this is a very helpful mm. strategy. Set a policy to guide yourself, set a policy to guide your organization so that you go against your intuitions. Right now, for example, I have a personal policy but before I implement any serious idea, I run it by someone who is skeptical, who would be hmm. pessimistic. So that's something I make sure to do as a personal policy. Twelve, make a pre-commitment. That means a public commitment to doing things a certain way. Hmm. I, we mentioned before, how do you address the shoot the messenger effect? You make a public commitment and you follow through on it to promote, praise those people who provide constructive critical feedback. And that's just one way of making a pre-commitment. You know, uh, in personal life, uh, you can make a pre-commitment that if you uh, don't uh, exercise every day for the next month, that you will make a donation to the $100 donation to a political party that you mm. really don't like, for example. Yeah. So making some kind of pre-commitment. So those are the awesome. 12 yeah. mental habits that mental habits that have been shown to effectively address cognitive biases by the cutting edge research. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, I really appreciate that. I'm sure my listeners will find that to be very, very useful. We, yeah, we've been going, uh, and I've loved this. This is, this was an excellent yeah, conversation. This was great. W wonderful as, as usual, Gleb. Before we go, so where can people, people get the book where can people follow you anything that that uh in terms of twitter social media all of that good stuff how uh, how can people connect with you well the book is traditionally published so it's available at bookstores everywhere never go with your gut how pioneering leaders make the best decisions and avoid business disasters so go to amazon go to barnes and noble amazon's online barnes and noble in person or online uh, props to indie bookstores. Go to them. So check them out. Mm -hmm. Check out the book anywhere. There. Do you know if it's available in the UK? Out. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So it's definitely available in the UK. It's available uh, in the 
I know it's available physically in the UK, in the US, and Canada. Okay, great. I think it's available in Australia too, but it's available for online order anywhere, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. Then if you want to check out my work, go to disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com. And you'll find a lot of all articles, videos, podcasts, and so on about what I do. You can sign up, register for my Wise Decision Maker Guide resources. So get them delivered to your inbox uh, twice a month. Then if you want to connect with me, the best way I connect uh, is on LinkedIn. So that's the best place to find me. So just type in Dr. Gleb Tsipursky, G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y. Find me on LinkedIn. Happy to connect. Tell me you heard me on Ben's show. And finally, if you have any questions about anything I said so far, please email me at gleb, G-L-E-B, at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, gleb at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Fantastic. I'm going to put all those links in the show notes. So if uh, anyone wants to connect with you, they can also check out the, the show notes and everything will be there. So no need to pause the, the, the your podcast and, and write fur furiously. All right. This was great, Gleb. I really enjoyed this. Very, very useful. Thank you very much. Please, please Thank continue you. to do the great work that you're doing. And I wish you all the best. Uh, I know that you've got another book coming out in April and mm -hmm. love to have you back to talk about that as well. Sure, we'll be happy to be back. And thank you so much for this lovely conversation, Ben. It's really great to have a conversation with somebody who is really understands the importance of uh, making the best decisions and avoiding cognitive biases. No, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Gleb. All right. A big thank you to Gleb for joining us on the show. Links to his book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, as well as other resources are on the show notes as usual. Also as usual, a like, a positive rating, a positive review for the All Things Risk podcast and any other love and positive vibes is always greatly appreciated. Thank you for joining us. We will be back soon. Until then, and as I always say, don't forget, risk is life.